in that last recording, the um, uh, it sort of stopped early. And I think it's because I had the graphic settings too high. Like I'm just using a surface here and it works well, but I think I set the graphics up to maximum and it was trying to process the video file. And so it, that's what happened. Because I think even the last recording might've cut off like a couple minutes, a couple minutes before it ended. But I toned it down a little bit, so I think it should be fine. Um, let's get started. Um, so welcome to lecture 11. We're going to actually get into block shear uh, today. We're actually going to do an example. Um, the uh, uh, We might end class, a, I don't want to say a little bit early, but um, uh, I want to at least introduce threaded rod design, but we're not going to like really get into it. Um, but I have just a couple things to, to, to mention about it. Um, 2.3 and 2.4 are graded, and then 2.5 and 2.6 are being graded. Um, if you look on Blackboard, um, you will see that um, uh, what I'm trying to start doing is, if you notice, I'm just sort of listing all the assignments in the main course content page, but then there's a folder called Older Assignments, and so what I'm trying to do is once they're graded, I'm just sort of moving them in there, bless you, so that when you don't log into Blackboard, there's not like 100 assignments. But the other thing is like, if you log into Blackboard and you see like 2.5, 2.6, and 2.7, it's sort of a visual indicator that everything else before that is graded. So I'm trying to make that a, a little easier. Um, uh, one thing I'll say about homework 2.7 is I think I'm going to extend the deadline to 5 p.m. Uh, I say that because uh, maybe, maybe I'm over course correcting, but I know last night I had a time trying to get onto Blackboard um, it was going in and out, and it was, I don't think it was just me because um, I was trying to message IT and they said all their staff were busy. Um, uh, so I'm just going to, whenever I get a chance to get on, I'm going to extend the deadline to 5 p.m. If you already submitted it, hey, great, you know, but I, I don't want you all to be disadvantaged by some software glitches uh, on, on the university's end. Um, the only thing I'll mention before that is we do have a celebration next Friday. So we have a homework due Monday. And then we have a homework due Wednesday. The homework that's due Wednesday, I'm not going to accept any late homework, okay? Because I'm giving you the solution right as it posts, okay? So this is like, it will be due at 9 a.m., okay? So get it done uh, before then. Sound good? Well, I hope it does. I'm trying to set the plan out well in advance. I know, I know. Okay. So uh, real quick, um, let's go through, I, I'm going to go through this part kind of quickly because I think I went through it in, in good detail last time, but uh, the focus of today's lecture is block shear rupture, um, and block shear rupture is um, just sort of this, um, I guess I'll just call it a weird phenomenon where you have sort of a combination of a tensile failure and a shear failure and you get this sort of chunk of the connection, this block of steel that tears off. We call it block shear because while it is a, uh, a failure associated with tension members, it only happens when there's some presence of shear uh, inside the, uh, the failure region. So that's why we call it block shear. Um, the equation in the spec is, um, as we mentioned last time, the equation is formatted kind of strangely because it says that the nominal resistance equals an expression less than or equal to another expression. And so whenever you see that in the specification, it's just sort of the specification's way of saying that the capacity is the minimum of these two, okay? Because it's saying that the capacity is this, provided that it's less than this. And so when you follow the, the if-then cases with that, really what it's just saying is the minimum of these two. All right, so um, let's see. So if we look at the expression, we can make the expression a little bit easier to digest because if we look at it, first off, we have a pile of junk plus UBSFUANT and then another pile of junk plus UBSFUANT. So we can pull that part out. And then if we look at the remaining terms, they're both multiplied by a 0.6. So we can move that, that term out as well. So suddenly we have an expression that's a lot easier to deal with, okay? Um, and if we start looking at the terms inside this expression, really everything that you see here should be familiar. I mean, I know we haven't done an AGT or an ANV calculation before, but we do see some gross and net areas, you know, um, so that should be pretty easy. FY and FU, we have yield and tensile stresses. We know what those are. We have our fee value is 0.75. Um, this UBS term is sort of like a shear lag factor for block shear. But in just about every case, 
that we're going to deal with in every case, uh, just for most cases that you'll deal with in the real world, uh, UBS uh, is 1. Um, now note the equation does not have an AGT term. There's an AGV, an AMV, and an ANT. There is no AGT, but you need a gross area intention before you can compute a net area intention. So we go ahead uh, and list that one as a term uh, as well. Um, we talked last time about that 0.6 and where that 0.6 comes from. And that 0.6 comes from a failure criterion called the von Mises failure criterion. And what a failure criterion is in general is whenever you have an element subjected to multiple different states of stress, we have to define some sort of mathematical expression that will let us determine whether or not the element has failed or not. And, we're, and to be clear, we're not really talking about specification land here. This is more theory land. This is more mechanics of deformable bodies, engineering 216 stuff. So whenever you have a state of stress and there's multiple stresses being applied, it, it's difficult to determine whether or not it's failed. Like if you have a piece of steel and you just yanked on it, whenever the stress hits FY, it, it's failed. We just say it's yielding. Um, I mentioned this failure criterion because you've either already seen it or you're going to see it. So this is the more Coulomb failure criterion. This comes from soil mechanics or geotechnical engineering. So this is the failure criterion that we use to assess whether or not a, a, an element of soil has failed based on its normal stress, its shear stress, its cohesion value, and its angle of internal friction. And so we can define this failure envelope and basically figure out whether the element has failed or not dependent upon whether the stress is above or below. Um, that failure criterion is fine and dandy for brittle materials like soils. It does not work for ductile materials like metals. And so that's why we use the von Mises criterion for steel, because it's more for ductile materials. If you look at the expression in two dimensions, this is what it looks like. And this is a very generic expression. So it's including all of the potential possible stress states. Again, we talked about this last time, so I'm going through this kind of quickly. Um, but this is, um, this is looking at two dimensions and all of the possible stresses that we can have on a given uh, a point in a structure. So at a given point in a structure, we could have stress in the x direction, we could have stress in the y direction, and we could have a shear stress. Um, and so we can determine whether or not it's failed by just comparing these stresses in this expression to Fy. Now, you could do a gut check and go, well, does that make sense? Well, if you set all the stresses equal to zero but one normal stress, well, it equals Fy, which, I mean, if you yank on it, it would yield when the stress equals Fy. But what about when you set everything to zero but a shear stress? Well, if you plug and chug, you end up getting that it yields when the shear stress is not Fy, but it's Fy divided by the square root of 3. And 1 over the square root of 3 is about 0.5774, so we round that to 0.6, and that is our limit. Okay, So I want to be crystal clear that whenever you see, uh, uh, w so a couple things, whenever you open the specification and you see something related to shear, there's probably a 0 0.6 in there somewhere. It's either baked into some of the values that you're using or it's literally right there. And whenever you see that 0.6, it is always associated with shear. It is not a factor of safety. That's not what's going on, okay? A factor of safety would be built on top of this. What I'm saying this 0.6 is, is if you take a piece of steel and you yank it, it will fail when it hits FY. But if you take a piece of steel and shear it, it will fail when the stress hits about 0.6 of FY. This isn't a factor of safety. This is a reflection of what's going to happen in the real world. Okay? So that, that's, I want to make sure that that idea is dispelled. Okay? And again, the only other thing that we haven't talked about is this UBS term. And in most cases, UBS is going to be 1. The only time when it's not is whenever you have a coped beam and you have multiple bolt row, or multiple rows of bolts on the, um, on the end of the connection. And we talked about last time why you would cope a beam. So coping a beam uh, it involves taking this top sort of flange and stem and sort of cutting it out a little bit. And the reason that we would do that is because if we're trying to uh, uh, frame up a, a, a floor, so we've got beams going this way and beams going this way, we can't really connect them and have a flat surface on top without notching a little bit out of some of those beams so that when you connect them in, they all sit flat. And that process is called coping. And so if you ever have a coped beam and you have multiple rows of bolts, UBS is 0.5. So like for this one up here, UBS is still one because it's just one 
row of bolts on, on each beam. Okay, but we're not going to be dealing with any of these types of connections this semester. So UBS is going to be one for us. Okay, any questions? All right, so today what I really want to focus on is identifying the potential block shear failure paths. And um, so I, I want to identify that by looking at the example uh, today. But really, I want to make sure that we're clear that whenever you're looking at a potential failure path, so you're trying to figure out which chunk of steel will rip out of the, uh, which block of steel will rip out of the member. In order for a chunk to rip out, it needs to satisfy a few rules. The first rule is it's got to leave all of the bolts intact. Okay, so that has to be a potential option. Um, it needs to separate the member from the connection, and it needs to include a path subject to shear. Okay, so for example, this path down here on the left, this is an option. Um, it surrounds around all of the bolts. So if I were to take a pair of scissors and cut along these little green lines right here, I would actually separate the member from this green block. So it would satisfy both the first and the second bullets, and it does have a shear path because this is in shear and this is in shear. Same thing with this path down here. This includes the shear path as well, and if I took a pair of scissors around this, it would leave all the bolts intact and it would separate the member. Okay. Now some of you might be thinking, well, can't you just cut like that? Well, yeah, you can cut like that, but that's not a block shear failure path. That's net section fracture. Okay. Uh, it's not block shear because there's no shear. There's no block rubbing up against, you know, we, we don't have a situation where this path is going this way and this path is going like that. Does that make sense? Don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the, uh, the, to the particulars. And we're actually going to get to the particulars right now with this problem. Okay. So I have an L six by four by five eighths, and I did tweak this problem a little bit since the last time. So I might need your help on some of the particulars with the math, okay? Because um, I changed the bolt diameter. Um, so we have an L six by four by five eighths of A thirty six steel, and it's to be used as a tension member. And we're using seven eighths inch diameter bolts, okay? So we're going to determine the design capacity according to block shear, okay? Um, let's uh, let's sort of. There we go. Let's go here. So um, a couple things. Uh, because we're dealing with an angle, we know that the thickness of this, um, this plate is 5 eighths. So I'll just say right here, let's just say draw here. Let's just say the thickness is 5 eighths. Okay, that's going to make our life a lot easier from looking things up in the manual. Really, the only thing that we need to look up in the manual is um, the yield stress and the tensile stress for A36 steel. But I don't know about you, but I've kind of memorized that at this point, that for A36 steel, which we can find that in table 2-4, we know that Fy is, and Fu is 58. Okay. All right. So here is our, um, uh, here's our problem, and we're going to try and determine the design capacity according to block shear. Oh, I guess I should go ahead and mention for the bolts that the bolt diameter is one inch, or the effective hole diameter. Now, the bolt diameter is seven eighths, so the effective hole diameter is one inch. I, I think by now we're all good with that. Sound good? OK. Now, um, let's see if we can start identifying some potential failure paths. Now, what I want to do is I want to try and include a little bit of three dimensionality on what we're looking at here. So what we're looking at is. Let's see, so we've got an angle that looks like this. Okay, so here's the angle 
and we are yanking on it like that. So we're pulling on it like this, okay? And so what we've got are one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's what we've got going on, okay? So we need to identify some potential failure paths, okay? Now, I can think of two really easy ones, okay? Um, somebody, let's see if they can raise their hand and tell me or help me describe the very first failure path. Yes, sir. So, like that. Okay, that is a potential failure path. We'll call that path one, okay? Now, can anybody think of, and, and, and I, whether it's likely or not, I just want to think about a possibility. Can anybody think of a second potential failure path? Yes. Along the top row, down, and then back along the bottom row. There we go, exactly right. So, this, this, this. That is a second potential failure path. That, that's, those are two potential realistic failure paths. So a question then is which one should we check, okay? Well, a simple way of thinking about it is imagine that that red line that I just drew and that green line that I just drew are pieces of yarn that I've stretched along. Which piece of yarn is shorter, the red one or the green one? The green one, right? So what that means is that the green one rips through a smaller area, right? Which means that the green one is going to have a smaller capacity. If I take this and I yank it, I'm more likely going to fail through the green path than the red path because the green path has smaller, a smaller amount of area to resist that load. Does that make sense? So you almost so like if you want a simple way of thinking about it, go through the path that has the shortest amount of yarn. Right? I know that's that's a really basic way of thinking about it, but it does kind of work out pretty well for for concept. So what I'm going to say is our failure path that we're going to check is this. So we're going to assume that that is the chunk of steel that's ripping off. And, and just to clarify, um, after we finish this problem, if you don't believe me and you think, well, we need to check the other path, you'll be armed with the ability to do that. But you'll sort of look at the numbers and go, I kind of see what Dr. Mike was talking about, that, that it's not going to govern. Um, but let's, let's, sort of, let's sort of digest this a little bit. Okay. So, okay. Now I'm going to redraw this connection a little bit and I want to, I'm going to redraw it here because I want to have something to reference right here and I want to make sure that we're identifying this path correctly. Okay, that needs to be a little longer. So we're yanking like that, okay? And so our failure path looks like this. Okay, so let's simplify some dimensions a little bit, okay? Um, let's see if we can make this easier, okay? What is this dimension right here. Does anybody have this drawn out? Can anybody tell me just what that dimension is? Ten and a half inches. Okay, so it's ten and a half dimensions, or ten and a half inches because this is three plus three plus three plus one and a half. That's ten and a half. What about this dimension? Okay. All right, and so this is my considered block. We just covered hatches in AutoCAD. So I'm thinking, that's what's got me thinking about that. Okay. All right. Now before we um, start doing some math, let's let's have some 
some observations here on behavior, okay? Um, we have a block that is essentially ripping like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this again. My apologies. Okay, so I'm going to draw the block without holes. I'm just going to sort of draw, draw it like this. So here's this. Okay, and we're yanking on it. Um, can you tell me this path right here? Because see, if, if I draw this sort of in 3D, and I sort of do this, I've got sort of this plane right here, and I've got that plane right there. See how, see how I'm doing that? Because that's the, the, the chunk that I'm ripping out. This sort of plane right here, this shaded plane, is this experiencing shear or is it experiencing tension? This plane right here. Say it again. This is shear, right? This plane right here is experiencing tension, right? So if I wanted to look at this, what I would do is I would say, I would do this. I would say this is my tension plane. And I would say this is my shear plane. Make sense? Okay, so with that, okay, let's start computing some areas. Remember that, you know, recall the thickness is 5 eighths, okay? So somebody help me out. How would we compute AGV? How do we compute that? It's an area, by the way, and it's simpler than you think. It, what's how do we do that? What's the what's the expression? It's there you go. Pretty easy. Just ten and a half times the thickness. So what do we get for this? Six point five six. I'm going to do it one more, just just so we have some common reference. And do I have a second? Just make sure we're all getting the same. Okay. This next one, I'm going to have a different quantity than you all because I, I changed my bolt diameter, so I really will need your help on this one. But let's talk about the net area in shear. Okay. Now the net area in shear. Let, let's let's not try and dig into the specifics. Let's keep it general. Okay. In general, whenever you calculate a net area, it is a gross area minus the area lost due to the presence of volts, right? So what I'm saying is that it is going to be whoop, AGV minus some number of holes. Now, is how many holes do I subtract from the gross area in shear to get the net area in shear? Three and a half. That is 100% correct. Okay, it's not three, it's not four, it's three and a half because to get from the gross area to the net area, I subtract one, two, three, and then a half, right? One, two, three and then a half. I'm not subtracting the, the whole uh, uh, diameter, it's just half of it. So 3.5. So this is 6.5, oh, come on, 6.563 square inches minus that, that. So I am going to need your help on that one. What do we get for this? We'll say three decimal places. Oh, wait, whoa, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got a mistake. This is one inch, right, because the whole diameter. Sorry. Do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. So now 
let's look at the gross area and tension. Now we're not going to directly use this quantity, but we need a gross area and tension to get a net area and tension. So somebody else, what's the gross area and tension going to be? 3.75 times 5. There you go. Okay, and so what do we get? Two point oh. Do I have a second? Okay, so just like before, we have a n t equals a g t minus some number times DET, okay? And how many holes are we subtracting from the gross area and tension to get the net area and tension? One and a half. One and a half, exactly right. So, so we've got 2.344 minus 1.5. times that. What was that? Second? Okay. So here are our areas, okay? And if we recognize that UBS is going to be what? One. One. So if we recognize that, now we've got everything we need. And now it's just one big old plug and chug, okay? So what we'll do is we'll chug this out, okay? So I'm going to do like this. Here, let me make this bigger so that I've got a little bit more room. The more room I have, the better, okay? So therefore, Rn equals, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take UBS, FU, ANT, plus 0 0.60 times the minimum of these two. Right. So, and again, I really like the way that this, um, I really like the way that this is structured. Let me make sure that comes across as a min because that does not quite look like an n. Okay, because what we're saying is, okay, for the shear terms, there's a 0.6 multiplied by everything associated with shear because behaviorally that makes sense. So we, the 0.6 is just reserved for the shear terms. And then for the tensile terms, we don't have a 0.6. I, I like the, the separation there, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to say 1.0, okay, we're going to have 58 KSI, Okay, A and T, we have 1.407. Now, before we start number crunching, I want to have some organization here. So let's have some organization here, okay? So let's start off with just this, okay? When we chug this out, what do we get? We'll just say two decimal places just to keep it simple. 81.61. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So we've got... plus 0 0.60. See, I got lazy there. Hold on. Let me move this. I forgot to put the minimum there. Okay, and let's do each row, okay? So this first one, I know I can do this first one for you. It's like, uh, is it 236? Okay. What about the bottom one? I need I need help on the bottom one. Do I have seconds on these? Okay. 
So that means here I, I'm I, that looked a little sloppy. I can do better than that. Zero point six zero. So equals eighty one. Bless you. Six one kips plus zero point six zero times. And I'm just going to take the minimum, which in this case is going to be that one. So this is two thirty six point twenty seven kips. And what do I get? 223.37. Do I have a second on that? So that's the answer, right? No. Why is it not the answer? That, yeah, well, you don't add, you multiply it. But, but you have to account for the resistance factor. This is a really easy thing to forget that we have a nominal resistance, but that's not what we're after usually. We're after phi Rn. And what do we get for this? Take a step back. What do y'all think? Okay. Anybody have any questions on this? All right. So I had a mouse. I don't know where I put it. Oh well. Oh, there it is. Sound good? Okay. So I want to show you something real quick. So this is going to be your a homework assignment for block shear. And so you're going to be calculating the block shear capacity of this problem. And what I would say is think about the problem three-dimensionally to try and identify your blocks. Okay. In other words, is it easier to rip through the entirety of the member than it is through just a small portion of it? So you might want to try and draw this sort of you know, like three-dimensionally, like try and draw it, you know, in an isometric view. And the other thing I would say is I would try and handle it one block at a time. In other words, I have a hint. I say take, sure, take care to ensure you're accounting for all the material. But I want to see if you all can identify what block shear failure path is going to make uh, the most sense for this. So uh, this one's sort of, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I want to see what you come up with. Okay. Any questions? All right, okay, so before we end, I want to begin a little bit of a discussion on threaded rods, but I want to take a step back and talk about Kansas City. And I'll level with you what we're about to talk about is a bit on the morbid side, okay? Um, how many of you have ever heard of the Hyatt Regency walkway collapse? How many of you have heard of that? A few of you have, okay? If you have not, um, this was an event that occurred in the early 1980s. Um, and this was in the lobby of the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City. Okay? And the collapse in, uh, uh, involves a suspended walkway that was in the lobby. Okay? So here's sort of what the walkway looked like you know, before its collapse. And this is what it looked like you know, in its aftermath. And this was a really, really bad day, okay? A really bad day. Um, to put this in perspective, um, there were about, I mean, there were over 100 deaths and over 200 uh, injuries. And to date, this is the deadliest uh, unintentional structural failure in American history. And, and I want to um, make sure I'm clear on what I mean by that. Because obviously some of you are thinking, well, what about 9-11? Or what about, you know, you know some, some of those other events? Um, those are what I would, uh, what the structural engineering community, not just me, but we, what we would characterize as extreme events, okay? And so to, to put it in perspective, um, I'm going to uh, give you an example 
How many of you have heard of the Oklahoma City bomb? Heard about that? Okay. So um, let me just throw some factoids at you about the Oklahoma City bombing to just sort of make the point. Um, when Timothy McVeigh parked the van next to the federal building, uh, pack, packed with explosives, uh, and the explosives went off, the explosives went off next to a main supporting column in the structure. Okay? The column experienced what's called a brisance failure. And uh, you, I mean, you can could, you could read this in the forensic report for Oklahoma City. And um, a brisance failure is when the steel column shatters, okay? I mean, it shattered, okay? I mean, that's how much explosive there was. Um, I mean, this column was a multi-story building. So we're talking about flanges of steel, about like that, and it shattered. There were reports of broken glass in Oklahoma City from up to a mile away from the bomb. Okay, there is no way that anybody could say that that is normal day-to-day -day operating procedures for, for the building, right? That is an extreme event, okay? And so the same, uh, so when I say that this is the de one of the deadliest or the deadliest failure in American history, I'm talking about under design load, under its normal operating loads. I'm not talking about extreme events like 9-11 or Oklahoma City or anything like that. I'm talking about as it was intended to be used 114 people died and 216 people were injured. So to date, it's it, it, it's still uh, 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 you know it, it's still a really bad day. So what happened? What actually happened that day? So um, this, if you've ever been, I mean, if you've ever been in a major city and been in a lobby of a major hotel in a, in a large uh, uh, city, the the hotel lobbies are huge, right? They're not. I mean, you could host events just in the lobby. I mean, they usually have you know, like restaurants in there that might have, you know, a bar They you know, they might have a stage for a band or whatnot. I mean, like if you've ever been in a big hotel, I mean, I'm sure most of you have, they're, they're big. I mean, you can host events there. And so this was in Kansas City, you know, in the early 80s, and they would host events. And they had this sort of tea dance event going on uh, in the, uh, uh, in the lobby. So there were about 1,600 people in the lobby. Um, and what happened was, so this is sort of a cross-section view of the lobby. And so this is the lobby, uh, the ground floor where people were, I mean, they were dancing, you know, having a good time. And this was the second floor, and this was the fourth floor. Okay, now the connection detail right here at the fourth floor looked like this, okay? All right, so this is, so we have a, a threaded rod. So now you can see why we're talking about it because we're gonna be doing threaded rod design. We have a threaded rod that was going from the ceiling to the bottom of the fourth floor skywalk, and then there was a second threaded rod that was going down. Okay. Well, what happened was, um, what what happened was, actually, I want to go back um, one slide. So what happened was this connection right here failed. Okay. So not only did the second floor skywalk fall, but the fourth floor skywalk fell on top. Right, so there. I mean, like basically, this happened. Okay, so it was really, really bad. Okay, really bad, and um, that's what happened. Here's why it happened. Um, what happened was this was how the connection was constructed, but this is not how it was designed. This is how it was designed. Okay. What was supposed to happen was there was supposed to be a single threaded rod that went from the ceiling all the way down. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I keep going back and forth. What was to happen is this was supposed to be a single piece that went all the way through, and that the 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 floor beams for the walkway just sort of hung on it. Well, what the contractor said is that's too complicated. The the threaded rods are too long. They're too hard to handle. So I'll cut them in half and I'll connect it like this. And um, I mean. Gosh, I mean, it saved like 20 bucks per connection. So, I mean, obviously it was a great idea. No, of course it wasn't. I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was a tragic idea. The problem was they didn't communicate that to the engineer. What happened was um, when, the, um, when the, the, the connection detail was changed, it doubled the force on this floor beam. And so you can see this is from one of the forensic uh, shots from the investigation. You can see that it just ripped right through. It doubled the force on that floor beam and popped right out. And um, I mean, it, like in all seriousness, the, the contractor, I mean, the reason that the contractor did it is because 
it saved on labor and time per connection. So, I mean, I'm not joking when I say it saved. I, I think, I mean, it was like, you know, dollars per connection. We're not talking thousands of dollars. It was really just a very, very small amount. But because the contractor did not, you know, because there was a lack of communication, um, it killed people, okay? I, you know, it's funny, it's not funny, but um, it's, it's, it's interesting that when you look at a lot of structural failures, a lot of times um, the, the real cause of failure ends up being a lack of communication, ends up being, you know, not being aligned with what was designed versus what was built. I mean, you, you see that happen quite a bit. Um, that's not to say that there, there aren't uh, failures that happen purely as a result of, you know, an, a lack of understanding of design, but um, you, you'd be surprised how rare that is. Like, for example, um, the uh, the I thirty five bridge collapse. How many heard of that? That was the one in Minneapolis or the Mississippi, right? And and you know, big old truss bridge. You know, disaster. And really, what happened is it was just the the, the flanges or the sorry the gusset plates were half as thick as they should have been. Now, that is, um, that is a design error, but I mean, after all the investigation and all that, it was, it was really just, just a, a blunder. There's, um, it, it's pretty rare that, you know, you, you, like, we don't really see it as much where, you know, you follow the specification, you do everything you're supposed to do, and it still fails. That, that, again, you, the, the big real issue these days when it comes to failure ends up being just communication, you know, not, not following through, trying to save money and whatnot. So I know that's kind of morbid, but the stuff we're doing in here is kind of serious, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, bridges fall down, buildings fall down, they could kill people. I mentioned right before class, I mean, there was a structural failure just the other day in uh, Boise, Idaho. There was construction at the airport and three people died, uh, a big steel frame collapse. So, um, you know, this stuff is serious. Um, what we're going to do uh, on Monday is... Uh, um, we're going to begin the discussion of threaded rods. And I'll just say a couple things about threaded rods. So what we're going to be designing are essentially these. Um, we're going to be looking at trying to select a, an appropriate diameter to resist a given tensile load. Um, one of the things that is kind of, I guess, nice from a design standpoint is that we really don't need to make any assumptions, okay, because... Uh, we don't have as many limit states to consider. Instead of gross section yielding, net section fracture, and slenderness, or block shear, we really only have one limit state, and that's just the, the, the failure of the rod uh, under tension, the tensile uh, 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 rupture. We don't consider slenderness because if you go to, here I'll skip ahead a little bit, um, we don't consider slenderness because if you remember, so if you go to the spec, the spec says there is no maximum slenderness limit for members in tension. If you're designing members on the basis of tension, the slenderness ratio shouldn't exceed 300. This suggestion does not apply to rods. This suggestion does not apply to hangers in tension. Threaded rods are inherently slender. They're sort of meant to be slender. So you don't apply a slenderness limit to threaded rods. So you can actually sort of derive the expression for threaded rods pretty easily. There, there's, not, there, there, there's not a lot complicated with it uh, from a math standpoint. So what we're going to do on Monday is we're going to look at this. So we are going to go back to that CE312 stuff a little bit and we're going to sort of treat this like it's a big old truss and see if we can solve for what's the load in this member and then how we would design it. Okay. And then on Monday, I will give you a homework assignment that let's just say you'll get the theme of the homework assignment as soon as you open it. Okay. So my apologies for ending lecture on Friday with, um, you know, uh, that morbid topic. But I, I do think it is worth mentioning every now and then that what we are talking about is pretty serious and that um, I don't want to, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to, you know, in class, like, scaring the heck out of you. But um, th this stuff's important, you know. So, um, you know, the, there's, there's an old... Uh, a saying like what's the difference between a physician and an engineer and that is a physician can only kill people one at a time you know um, and that's like it's tongue in cheek but it, it, it's pretty important okay I'm going to pull up the QR code one more time in case anybody missed it but that's all I have everybody I'll let you out a few minutes early and I will see you all on Monday